Hi everyone, uh, Happy New Year to you all and welcome to the Equal Opportunity Committee's first meeting of 2013. Could everyone please set any electronic devices to either flight mode or switch them completely off? Um, I'd like to start by introducing everyone at the table along with members and witnesses are the clerking and research team, official reporters and broadcasting services and around the room we are supported by the security office and can I welcome the observers in the public gallery. My name is Mary Fee and I'm the committee convener. Can I now ask committee members and witnesses to introduce themselves in turn? Marco. I'm Marco Biaggi, MSP for Edinburgh Central and deputy convener. Good morning, I'm Dennis Robertson, uh, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Alec Johnson, MSP for North East Scotland and a substitute member of the committee. I'm Phil McMahon, I'm a MSP for Central Scotland. John Mason, I'm MSP for Glasgow Shettleson. Elizabeth Roddick, I like to be known as Betty and I'm a vice convener of Lock Gilbert Community Council. Kenneth Johnston from Girvan, I prefer to be known as Ken. <laughs> Sheila Chambers, uh, Vice Chair, Kirkenzie and Port Seaton Community Council and representing all the community councils in East Lothian. Uh, James Brownhall, Vice Chairman of NIG Community Council in Aberdeen City. Mr Hearn, Chairman of the North Mutant Community Council in Perth. That we also this morning have apologies from John Finney, MSP, who is unwell this morning and unable to attend um, committee. Agenda item one today is an evidence session on where gypsy travellers live with representatives from community councils. And can I welcome um, Christopher Ahern, James Brownhill, Sheila Chambers, Kenneth Johnson and Elizabeth Roddick. What we hear today will help us to better understand the relationship between the settled community and gypsy travellers and will help to inform our future evidence sessions as well as our inquiry report. Committee members will have a number of um, questions for our panel of witnesses this morning, but could I start off the question session by asking each of you what involvement you have had with gypsy travellers in your area, and have any of you visited any gypsy traveller sites? And I don't know who would like to start, oh, that's fine. Thank yes, you. Um, we've got um, the Double Dykes um, permanent site about a mile away from where we are, and then we have two um, two areas that they like to use as a site. Um, I was up uh, about three months ago and I visited the travellers on one of these unofficial sites. Um, it was by accident because we were up there with the planners that were planning to build on the site they were actually camped on. Um, they were quite pleasant um, and all the ones we have uh, visited they are pleasant enough um, to talk to, they understand the problems. Um, but they just leave a problem. Um, I've never, we've never had any, any animosity with them. Um, most of the complaints that have been are about the mess they leave behind. Um, but no, we've not had that sort of problem with them in terms of uh, anger or anything else. Uh, well, NIG, NIG uh, Community Council is the southern part of Aberdeen City uh, in a fairly rural area, um, but close to some industrial estates. So it's, it seems to be fairly attractive to gypsy travellers over many years, primarily in summer, but also in winter. And, but our, my experience and our experience in the Community Council is purely with unauthorised um, campsites. There's no... Um, halting site for gypsy travellers within Aberdeen City, but they do have one at Clintity outside of the city, um, which is criticised as being a bit far out and remote. So our experience is purely with unauthorised uh, travelling sites. Um, and our, our, I have, in, if you want, gone to them after the gypsy travellers have left. I have walked through them whilst the gypsy travellers are there, um, but it's not a pleasant experience either whilst they're there or when they've left. Um, so our experience over many years is not at all favourable. Um, just as, as this gentleman said, it's, it's what they leave behind that's most unsavoury. But it's also, um, to some extent, harassment whilst they're there. 
uh, noise for people that live close by. Um, it's not, well, fly tipping seems to be standard for, for every, almost every unauthorised encampment. And unfortunately, um, human waste is often left behind too in a fairly unsavoury manner. Um, I've, I've mentioned, mentioned uh, noise as well, I think. We've tried to, in the past, and so has uh, the, um, the um, Association of Aberdeen City Community Councils, uh, have tried to get the Gypsy Traveller community to attend meetings, but that's never been taken up by us as an individual community council, nor the, neither by the citywide forum. And from speaking to other community councils within the city and to some extent within the Shire, uh, this, this is a widespread problem with unauthorised campsites and the impression that is uh, given by them, which is a particularly unfavourable impression. And therefore, we find when Aberdeen City talk about an authorised campsite, which they have temporarily designated one within our community council area very recently, um, it's not particularly well received by the settled community. Um, the gypsy travellers aren't particularly welcome because they don't have a good reputation at all. And the current temporary site that Aberdeen City have offered them um, has been executed on a verbal arrangement um, based, well, for, for a group of, of 12 units, which has now risen to 28, uh, which again doesn't go down particularly well with the local community, both the residential and business community. The business community is now meeting every two weeks to address the problem, and the problem is not just the fly tipping, which has been witnessed, um, but also breaches of security in the, in the neighbouring industrial estate, estate and loss of stock from some of the retail outlets. Um, how long this unauthorised, uh, sorry, this authorised campsite is continuing, it's been difficult to assess, but it seems to have been based around originally one of the gypsy traveller ladies being pregnant and wanting to give birth at Aberdeen Hospital. That has now happened, um, and we have a meeting today, two meetings today with the council, in fact, to see what the future holds. But generally speaking, um, the gypsy travellers, who tend to be transient in Aberdeen mm. throughout the year, though, uh, do not have a good reputation with the settled community, and no settled community really wants to see a permanent halting site on their doorstep as a result. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sheila? Um, in preparation for today's session, I emailed all the other community councils in East Lothian. There is one official site in East Lothian which is used throughout the year, um, and there are no problems reported from that. However, it would appear that um, <coughs> there are quite a number of problems, particularly along the coast, um, where we have some lovely beaches and uh, we attract a lot of tourists in the summer. <coughs> uh, there are several sites uh, that they go to, um, mainly, as I, as I say, um, adjacent to uh, nice beaches and these people tend to stay for very short periods of time, up to two weeks. They, many of these sites are not particularly close to the settled community. Um, for instance, Long Nidri Bents is some distance away from most of the houses. But when they are there, 
this acts as a deterrent to tourists. Tourists will not go into the car park. They're in the car park, and tourists will not are reluctant to go into the car park, partly because of the mess and partly because of uh, reports of abusive um, attitudes of by the travellers. <coughs> The, um, in speaking to a number of people in East Lothian, there are many who recognise and respect the fact that travellers have a different way of life, a different culture. However, they feel there's a very strong feeling that this respect is not mutual. And therefore, uh, you know, they have a, a, not a very good reputation. <coughs> In particular, it is the mess that they leave behind that is worrying. Um, and we are aware that this has cost East Lothian Council a considerable sum of money to um, deal with. Some of the mess is um, offensive. Um, we have a fairly new problem arising. Um, the uh, car park at Long Nidri, um, the council have put barriers up so that the, uh, the travellers can't get in anymore with their caravans. And so they have started coming to the land around Kirkenzie Power Station. <clears throat> Kirkenzie Power Station is closing on the 31st of March. And um, we have a fear that the travellers will come more and more to this area. This area is not, <coughs> is not owned by East Lothian Council, it is owned by Scottish Power. So ownership of the land presents another problem in, um, if necessary, getting eviction orders or in dealing with the mess. <coughs> Furthermore, uh, parts of this site are quite close to local houses and there have been reports of people looking out of the window and seeing people defecating in open, which is not very nice. Um, I think that's all at the moment. <laughs> Thank you for that. Ken? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I've got a totally different perspective on this. I think your question was, um, what interaction had I had with, and uh, to be honest, until I was coming here today, I had none. Because we have a permanent site in Girvan and there's never been any trouble at all that I know of. It all seems to work very well. It's very well managed. Um, knowing I was coming to this, I went down to the site earlier this week and had a look. As I say, it seems to be very well managed. Um, you, you, would, you would say you were on a housing estate, other than the fact there's chickens running about. I don't see many of them. But other than that, you would say you were in. You could be in any housing estate. Um, we've had no trouble. They've been there many years, and to be honest, I had forgotten we had them. I think the site is is well sited because it's it's to the north of the town. It's not near any housing. You have the railway sort of runs or sweeps around the edge of the town, and they're on the other side of the railway, other side of a road, and down in a valley. So they're not seen from the road. Um, they're not near any houses, as I say. So um, I think it's just well managed, and they they want to keep to themselves, and they can manage it. Thank you for that, um, Betty. Um, in Lochilpid, we've got a permanent <coughs> site as well, um, and I know there's been work done with um, Acha, that's our Gael Community Housing Association. And they have <coughs> modernised one up at no, was it Turlundi, I think it was. They have done one. There is quite a few permanent sites in Argyll and Butte. Um, the problems we get is not with the... Now, this maybe sounds silly, but our local travellers, if you know what I mean, they're, they're more local. Um, it seems to be the ones that come in, um, and I suppose you'd class them as a different clan, and they come in and they think it, everything is owed to them and they're allowed and they use the traveller gypsy card, let's get out of jail free. Um, I, I have a, a friend who's got a neighbour who just happened to be traveller and the first few weeks was fine and then the noise started getting really bad. So she went to the door and she asked them to cut it out. And the fellow said to her, 
uh, you're just picking on me because I'm a traveller. She went, no, I'm picking on you because you're a noisy bee. Now cut it out. And if you stand up, and they know where you are. And in Loch Gilpid, we have got lots of, I suppose they were classed as travellers, they're no longer travellers because they are now in permanent housing and settled in permanent housing. And they make great neighbours and they're great people. I've worked with people who are travellers. Um, I've been, I'm friends with travellers. And if you show them respect, they show you respect back. I think a lot of the problem is it's not talking with them. You're talking down to them and you're telling them how they will behave. And they are aliens and they should be hidden out of sight. No, they are human beings, the same as you, me and everybody else. Their way of life is changing, changing drastically because of the economic climate and what used to happen no longer happens. So I think they are in a bit of a, 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 a kind of sway. They don't know which way to go for the best. Um, although I'm saying that, I, I do feel that the, some of the younger ones have got a big chip on their shoulder by using the travel card, the sorry, the gypsy traveller card. Um, but in Loch Elpid itself, there is some trouble, but everybody knows who they are, um, and they sort of stand up to them. If you stand up to them, you don't get trouble. But if you knuckle down, that's when the trouble starts. Thanks for that. Can I ask then a, a follow-up question to you all? Um, and it would be, what have your community councils done to try and engage and understand the culture of gypsy travellers? Because I hear what you're saying about, you know, the, the, the transient nature, the, the come in, they leave a mess, they move on, and they seem to leave just antagonism and, and the view of the community is not a particularly positive one. Mm -hmm. So have your community councils done anything to improve that by engaging with gypsy travellers, inviting them along, having a, maybe a, a social evening where gypsy travellers could talk about what their culture means to them? We haven't. I think that's because a lot of people feel intimidated by them. Mm -hmm. I mean, one the, the one problem, the, the site that we've got the main problem with is by the side of a footpath that goes to a school. And when they're there, nobody goes along it. Nobody takes their dogs for a walk along the, water, the river. The local youth football team tend to sort of move away because they're on part of the ground where they play the foot, one of the pitches where they play the football. So I don't think they want to interact. Gypsy travellers want to interact. I don't think the community think or the, local, the gypsies the local do. Community? No, I don't think it's. E I don't think either community wants to in interact. But no effort has been made to try and do that. No. No. Okay. <coughs> I did mention before that both our community council and the forum of community council in Aberdeen had both made approaches, and the the forum was for three places for gypsy travellers to be on the forum, and all have led led to nothing. Um, so it's, you know that that's as far as we've gone um, to learn more about the culture of gypsy travel as well. You, you can read about it, and, and you can you know read read about minutes of meetings like this, for instance, um, to learn more about it. But as a post, uh, you know, as far as approaching them directly and sitting down with them directly, that hasn't worked for us. And I personally would be very apprehensive about going into a, an unauthorised gypsy traveller encampment and, and approaching them in that manner. I, I, I just wouldn't. I would have to do it through Aberdeen City uh, gypsy traveller liaison officer and, and be accompanied by them. There's just no way I would go in on my own or even two of us from the community council. I, I would expect you'd be opening yourself up to accusation of harassment. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Yes, I don't. We haven't had any interaction with them at all. Um, <coughs> partly, I suppose, because the encampments are d a little bit distant from uh, the, the settled places, um, and it, maybe it's a day or two before you find out that they're there, and by that time there's a good bit of a mess. However, we have. I was speaking um, to the local community policeman. And he tells me that once they know that there is um, a temporary site uh, in existence, they visit 
on a regular basis and try to form a relationship with them. And generally speaking, um, this happens, although it usually takes a day or two, and by that time they're thinking of moving on. Um, however, the most recent one, we did have um, a visitation in November, which is quite unusual because mostly it's in the summertime, but this was on Kenzie Power Station grounds. And um, the policeman said that um, these people were he, he, abusive and they really were frightened a bit. And that's policemen in, um, in uniform. And also they had, as many do, um, fairly vicious looking dogs. Um, who were barking and, you know, putting the fear of death into people as well. Thanks for that. Yeah, as I said earlier, um, we've had no trouble with the site, so the Gypsy Travellers has never been even mentioned at our, any of our community council meetings because we've plenty of problems without trying to look for any. <laughs> so, <laughs> no problems, so, no, actually, we've not, not had any interaction until I, I did that this week. Okay, thank you. I don't think a community council as such as has had, as a, as a community council, has had interaction with the, tra the Gypsy Travellers, but the people in the community have had loads of interaction. Um, you've got the old worthies who are, oh, you know, they're Gypsy Travellers, blah, blah, but you, the younger mm -hmm. ones are more inclined to see a more positive side of being friendly. Um, and I, I think, yes, you can go in and you can feel intimidated, but if they shout at you, you just speak back. You talk back. You do not shout back. That immediately takes your system down. And a lot of people who want to visit gypsy travellers who feel they're going to be aggressive need to have that, that in their head and have a bit of training as to how to take a situation back down. And it's very easy to do. It takes a lot of willpower and a lot of strength but in, on the whole, we have had no problems with them. You've got the odd one who shouts their mouth off, and basically you just tell them to, you know, pull their neck in. But other than that, we've not had no problems. As I say, the most problems that we have is with the incoming different clan. Um, so I think that's where the, the, the problems are happening in Argyll and Butte, but not in a... Thank you for that. I'm going to bring in um, John Mason with a question. Oh, sorry. We have a permanent site at Double Dykes, um, which is about a mile away from the two temporary sites that we've got in our local community. And it's not just an interaction problem with the community and the travellers, it's an interaction between the travellers and the travellers, the people that want to have settled sites and the ones that don't. I mean, in a previous uh, committee meeting you had, when you had, you had the travellers in, she made a comment about it, saying there's always the good and the bad within the travel community as there is within any any community. And I think that's a problem as well. So if you're trying to... The, the person that controls... The, the council person that controls the site, the permanent site, has now got responsibility for the two temporary sites. But I think he still has problems, um, even trying to communicate and getting um, his or the permanent community settled in double dykes, getting their points of view across to the other travellers. They just don't want to listen. Thank you for that. Um, I'll bring in John Mason and then Marco Biagi. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, it's very interesting listening to you. I mean, it's, it strikes me quite starkly that uh, there seems to be much less of a problem if it's a permanent site and much more of a problem with unauthorised sites or informal sites listening to what most of you are saying, with some exceptions. I mean, that then suggests to me that if we had more... A, well, permanent sites, but for temporary use, then, and they would have proper toilet facilities and they would have proper refuse facilities, that might go some way to solving some of the problems you're talking about. Would you feel that? A lot of, a lot of the travellers don't want those sort of sites. The permanent site, we have different problems. Yes. Like by the police having to go in with the electricity board because they're bypassing the electricity which made the news, mm -hmm. and other problems. You get this different sorts of problems. There's also a temporary uh, site down near Kinross, which you can stay there for a minute two weeks. Travellers don't want to use it. They use the local... They stay there to sleep, but they go to the local motorway station to wash and shower because it's cleaner than the site. 
They don't want these permanent sites. Well, um, they don't want a second rate per permanent site, yeah. from what you're saying, yes. Yeah, and we've, the per Perth and Kinross Council are trying and have them had the money for a long time to build another one, but they just can't find a place to put it. Either the landowner doesn't want it, or Perth and Kinross Council, when they vote to place it, argue between themselves and don't put it forward. But a lot of the time, it's it, they're dirty, and the travellers don't want to use them, which is why they use the sites outside. Is that the Slothian experience? Yes. Yeah. Um, in, in I did ask the councillors what their policy was, and uh, they, in fact, uh, would like to have a site for temporary uh, use, um, you know, where there was a maximum stay of maybe two weeks or something like that. Their difficulty is finding a site uh, because there's the NIMBY situation, you know, nobody wants it next door to them. They haven't been able to identify a suitable place to have this site. Look, I mean, I was just pressuring that. I mean, from the community council's point of view, it might be better to have a, a permanent site that everybody knew about than just kind of appearing in different places, would it? Well, if the travellers were willing to use it. Yeah. I think, I think you might also have a problem with temporary sites in that, but I know in the permanent sites, they're certainly the one in given, they pay to stay there. They pay a rental per week. Now, obviously the ones who are just turning up and camping somewhere are paying nothing. So if you put up a temporary site um, and you, if you charge for it, you know, or if you don't charge for it, you'll probably get them to go there rather than go to camp somewhere else. But you could also get the permanent people saying, well, why should I be paying? I'll just move to that temporary site for a while, you know, and not pay anything. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a catch-22. Did you want to come in? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I don't know whether we're getting our terms mixed up here, but, you know, I, I think of as a permanent site as being a, a permanent facility provided by the council. Now, it can be for gypsy travellers who want to stay there for a long time, it's kind of semi-permanently, or it can be a halting site whereby gypsy travellers just stay for a, a defined period. Um, we've obviously heard from from Lock Ilped there that you know when the gypsy travellers stay for a, an extended period over many years, they become almost part of the community, which seems in the long term a great solution, and it, and it's been proven. Um, but when the gypsy travellers are, are, are travelling through. Uh, even if it's a permanent site and they're only staying there for, for maybe five weeks or two months or whatever, there's still a travelling community and not building any relationships with the, the settled and local community. And therefore, the permanent site, halting site, probably has some of the problems associated with unauthorised campsites. However, I do agree, and Aberdeen City has always... Uh, uh, strove to find another permanent site, halting site, so they were, the gypsy travellers would only t stay for a, a certain period. Um, but as we've heard, nobody in the settled community wants it near them um, because of past experiences. However, in this last couple of weeks, Aberdeen City have designated a site for a, a permanent uh, facility. Uh, whether this will go ahead or not, uh, they say it will, but obviously it's met with local opposition Im immediately. So I'm not sure the status of that. It's very, very new news. But I, I would agree that a properly managed permanent halting site should be far better than unauthorised campsites being set up here, there and everywhere and the council chasing them off and having to clear up different places all over the place. Mm. I mean, certainly one of the things that we've heard, excuse me, in previous um, evidence sessions with Gypsy Travellers was the lack of transit sites. And it has been suggested that to do a mapping exercise with the Gypsy Travellers to properly map the route that they take to build, if you like, permanent transit sites would be a solution. And would the view of the panel be that that would be a good thing to do, to have fixed transit sites? I think if you did know the area that they were going to and you had proper maps and you could say yes, <coughs> then you're probably going to end up with your settled community having the prejudice against them. 
but then the settled community are just going to have to like it or lump mm. it because that is part of life. Um, I feel it. I mean, I've got a, I've got grandchildren who are great friends with travellers who who live permanently in Loch Gilpin, yes, but they're still travellers. They live in the permanent site and there's some in the houses. And th they don't think anything about them being travellers. It's, 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 it's this inbuilt prejudice. You know, if you're a traveller, well, you're bad. No, you only get bad apples. You only get an old bad apple. And I just feel that that's what's wrong. You know, we need to educate the settled community as well. Because how would the settled community feel? Well, we've had perfect examples of flooding. Now, they have, may have been forced to go into uh, caravans or whatever. How would they feel if they were told, well, you can only be in there for a couple of weeks? Or whatever that you know, if you put it back to them, then you could maybe see that a difference, because everybody's lifestyles change, and regardless of whether you're a gypsy traveller or a normal settled person, with the economic climate and everything else that's going on, everything is changing. Well, that's anyone else, Sheila, and then James. Um, I think that if you involve the travellers in the discussions about where the sites were to be. Um, that would be a step forward in getting them to use the sites that were available to them rather than unofficial sites, which could undoubtedly cause problems. Yes, I, I read the minutes of your previous meeting about mapping you know, uh, traditional sites, but um, some of the arguments there, which I personally agree with, this is not the view of, of New Community Council, it's my personal view, is, uh, is the mapping exercise... Well, as we've heard, the, the situation for the gypsy travellers is changing quite quickly and their old lifestyle is, is, is disappearing. So to map the traditional sites, to me, seems to be a little bit of a waste of time. It would be a nice thing to do for historical purposes, but it's not going to help us to move forward. Uh, we would be better spend our time on, on liaising and, and, and creating a good dialogue with the gypsy travellers to identify their needs and their expectations against the, and very much with the settled community's needs and expectations and obviously the council's capabilities on coming up with a, a package and it might be you know, a, a permanent site with permanent resident, a halting site or local housing, which we've heard has worked there. But it needs to be a, a discussed package between the, the, the councils or, or the Scottish government councils, the gypsy traveller community and the settled community to come up with the best solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that. Sheila? As far as East Lothian Council is, uh, East Lothian is concerned, um, I don't think individual community councils would welcome that kind of approach. Perhaps the um, association of uh, local community councils within East Lothian might be an appropriate place, but um, I think it would be quite difficult for them, partly because of the transient nature of the um, stay of the travellers. You know, they move on and you can't make a relationship with people when they're only there for two weeks. Did you want to come in, Mr. Hamner? No, I just I, I agree with the rest of them. I just think you're going to find it very difficult with local communities. I certainly wouldn't um, agree to a transient site where we are. We've got one permanent site. Um, Perth and Kinross Council, Fat Tayside, are going to be increasing housing outside of the cities. So if, where are you going to put it? Most of the land that we've got available for buildings being built for local housing. I certainly wouldn't appreciate it being houses in virtually within the city centre of Perth, and that's where they come into. Uh, I don't think, not just our local community, I don't think any local community in Perth or any sort of city would agree to a traveller site within the sort of city boundaries. That's for that, yeah, James. Yeah, I would agree. Within the city boundaries, it's tough because there isn't that much space. And you know, my experience is Aberdeen City, there's very little space. Um, so the, the answer, I'm not saying the answer, this, it, after all this dialogue and discussion, I didn't say it, it necessarily the, the, the best site would be within the city. I believe personally, and well, it's, it's been recorded elsewhere, that the gypsy tra travellers like their seclusion. They like the family around them and they like the seclusion and the privacy. And so 
they don't get that amongst the settled community, not close up to a settled community. So they need to be somewhere slightly detached from a settled community. Clintity for Aberdeen is, is too far out, they say. Um, but this is where the dialogue needs to, to, to be set up to reach this optimum solution. And the optimum solution won't be nestling right next door to a settled community, or as Aberdeen City is promoting uh, in a local development plan, gypsy traveller sites within major developments, which is, is not going to work. The gypsy travellers want the seclusion, the settled community don't want their human rights abused, um, and so a compromise has to be reached somehow, but the Optum Gypsy Traveller site will not be next door to a, a settled community. One now to Marco Biagi and then Dennis Robertson. Thank you. You've outlined a very wide range of issues that have come up uh, in your experiences. Where primarily do you think responsibility <coughs> and leadership should come from uh, for resolving them? You've already touched on that yourself, but I'd be interested to know where all the members think leadership should come from. Past meetings, it, I, I can't remember who came up with it. It could have been yourself, I, I can't remember, but it was the three L's. Uh, legitimacy, I think, land and leadership. You know, the, the legit, legit, legitimacy of, of the gypsy travellers to have their human rights and equality, which I'm sure we all agree with here and certainly New Community Council does. The land on which they're going to live or, or you know, temporarily live upon and the leadership which is going to sort all this out. And that's your question, where's the leadership going to come from? It can't come from the community councils. We don't have enough influence. You know, we're, we're volunteers. Um, it has to come from the regional councils or, or the, you know, Aberdeen City Council in my case, but it has to come from <coughs> regional councils. I'm not that familiar with Scottish government, but maybe it should come from, from higher up so that and again, I've read this before, so that we're all doing the same sort of things. So there's a standard. So a gypsy traveller that's coming from the Highland to Edinburgh sees a, or knows the standards to expect and what might be there, rather than doing it on a piecemeal by piecemeal basis. I don't know. I think it's got to come from the Scottish government and the gypsy leaders, whoever, however they form their, their gypsy community whoever's in charge of their community, I think it's got to come from them. I don't think it's got to come regionally because re a lot of the time a regional council is going to say, we don't want it, we don't want to spend the money on it. And they'll just pass the buck up. So I think it's got to come from central government and the gypsy, le gypsy community leadership. Yeah, I, would just say it would, I feel it should, it should come from you here at the Scottish Government um, and, and work it down through the councils. Yeah, I agree. I think it should come because then everybody will have to sing off the same hymn sheet, whether they like it or not. And that is a problem. A lot of them are just pushing it under the carpet. Alex, do you want to come in on a brief supplementary? Well, and then I'll come on that subject, the, my experience is that the guidance that comes from the Scottish Government or has in the past uh, is probably inadequate. Uh, but there is some, uh, and there is a, a view there that helps to guide what happens. Uh, but coming from the North East, I have uh, experience of working with the problem in a whole range of uh, local government areas, both rural and city. And my experience is that you can hand down the same uh, opinion, the same guidance, and local authorities will interpret it in a whole series of different ways. So do you have a, a view on whether uh, local government <coughs> needs to be given much, much, more, uh, much stronger uh, guidance or whether the, the, the system at the moment where we have a series of different interpretations uh, is sustainable? I think that given the diversity of the different areas of Scotland, it would be impossible to have the same interpretation of, Scot of Scottish Government guidelines in each area. 
Um, you know, there's cities, there's uh, rural areas, there's areas of tourist uh, attraction, there's areas which are less so, etc., etc. All sorts of different things in each area. So to make a blanket um, sort of ruling for all and expect it to be interpreted in a similar manner, I think, is unrealistic. So you, you've suggested that what we need is um, strong guidance coming down from the top, but yes. if it's going to be interpreted differently it, everywhere, what's the, the advantage in the strong central guidance? It's the same across the board. If it comes interpreted century, differently in different yeah. areas. Yeah. I mean, it depends if, how the gypsy or the traveller community feel about being dictated to. Mm -hmm. Anything that comes from central <coughs> government feels like a dictation. What, what I'm trying so, to get here is, it, is, it, is there really a one-size-fits-all approach to be found here, or uh, is the, the current piecemeal approach the one we have to build on? I think if, if central government <coughs> here decided what was going to happen, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be pu pushed out from here, it would be pushed out to the local authorities. So they're going to get involved in it. But I think if the decision about what's going to happen comes from here and is then passed down to the local authorities, say, right, take, take uh, Perth and Kinross or Tayside, this is what you've got, these are where the travellers come, you must provide one site, you must find it. But if the, if the edict came from central government in cons consultation with the travellers, I think you're going to get a much better... I don't think the travellers would like to be dictated to. I don't think East Lothian Council has had any interaction with the travellers themselves, although I'm not sure, but I don't think they have. Uh, and I th really think that, in a way, that's key to developing relationships uh, with the travellers and getting the ones who don't behave very responsibly uh, to perhaps um, respect the settled community. You said earlier uh, about, about setting up... Uh, a route which the travellers followed. Um, so if, if you were doing that, you would actually have to go to each local authority and say, we need a site within so many miles of point A, so that, so that there was that day's travelling or whatever between the sites. Um, you would, somebody, and it could only be the Scottish government that could do that, would, would need to say to each local authority, okay, we need a site in your area, we need a site here within several, give them, you know, an area where the, where the site is to be, not a, a specific spot. Mm. But you would, you would need to tell them that you needed a site within a, a given area. Mm. That's the only way it would work. Alex, did you want to come back in on that? Mm. I'll come back to Marco just, then. Just sorry. on that. I mean, oh, sorry, Marco, oh. before you carry on. Um, Alex may be familiar with, was it the Canforth or Canforth report that Aberdeen City, Shire and Murray did in 2008? And, and they were complimented on that because they'd got together, the three authorities, to try and evaluate what was required by the gypsy travellers. And I think I wasn't involved with it or aware of it at the time, but reading it since then, they seem to have consulted with the gypsy travellers and come up with some facts and figures and what was required. And, and they were complimented on doing that, the three authorities coming together to do that. But it's now, you know, getting to be five years old. Um, and I, I think it's perhaps not relevant because as we've heard, things are changing all the time for the gypsy travellers. But that was a good effort. Uh, I not particularly knowledgeable, but I think the failing has been to act upon it, on the findings of it. I don't know how, how familiar you are with it, Alex, and whether you'd want to be able to comment better than I on that, but it was a, a, a combined attempt to find out some facts and do something about it. Can, can you tell any, say any more on that? I'm no expert on it, but it's certainly a, a, a commendable effort, but one that has now been lying for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, with little <clears throat> progress, for all the reasons you outlined earlier yourself. Just coming to this, uh, back to this idea of national leadership, which um, Alex has quite well fleshed out as well, why would you say that national leadership would be able to achieve results in in terms of delivering something noticeable on the ground in a way that council leadership thus far hasn't. And 
although you've all got sites in your areas at the moment, if you didn't and some kind of national guidance or national decision or national agency came along and said you should have a transit site in your area and you're going to have to live with it, how would you anticipate your response uh, being to that? Because I would imagine um, that would throw up the same kind of difficulties, the same kind of opposition, the same kind of community uh, issues as from the council. If it, came that, if it came from central government, I think it would be standardised across the board. If you just left it to the, the local authorities, you're going to have a different one opinion from one local authority, another opinion from another local authority, and so forth across the country. And maybe the travellers won't, you know, they're, all, they're too strict there, they're not interested, we'll, we'll move across. You're just pushing the problem around the country. Whereas if you had a standardised approach across the, across the country, then the gypsies themselves and the travellers themselves aren't having to battle with different standards across the country. I think that um, there is certainly by East Lothian Council a, a negative approach to the travellers because they, they make a mess and it costs the council to clear up the mess, so it's negative. And maybe if there was a more positive approach was floated with... Um, you know, interacting with the travellers um, rather than just seeing them as a problem and reacting when they arrive, which is what happens. Thanks for that. Does anyone else want to come in on that? I just say that um, the negative approach I agree with in a lot of the council areas that you can eat, because you, you hear travellers talking about it. But you've got your temporary sites. Well, rather than the councils waiting until these temporary sites get mucky and unhygienic and everything else. Why don't they go and ask, or the liaison officers ask, do you require a toilet facility, the toilet facilities? Because you have got the mobile ones, you know what I mean? The ones that you use for events and stuff like that, that may let them see that they're not just out in a limb and they're not going to be dictated to. You, you know, you don't say you have to have it, but be nice about it. If you go in with a positive approach, you'll come out with positivity at the end. Instead of going in and saying, you can't do this and you can't do that. Because let's face it, nobody would like somebody to come into their home and say, you can't do this and you can't do that. It's their home. So I think that there is a change in approaches. Thank you. Have the money put aside to, to, to do another transient site. Um, and that's with somebody on there and with permanent facilities. But they're not going to make any money from it. They're not going to recoup the cost. So it's going to be a, a cost on the council that we, the council taxpayers, are going to have to come up with the money for. Yeah, from my, from my experience over, over the, quite a, the last quite few years, but, um, then, well, Aberdeen City Council... I've talked about that 2008 report. Really nothing much has been done since that, and, and the problem hasn't gone away, and the problem seems to have got worse and worse because of more and more unauthorised campsites. So I believe that you know, leadership from above the, the regional city councils is, is required to make sure something gets done. Other, otherwise, from my experience, the councils just kind of squirm and and look in the opposite direction and hope it'll go away and, and it's, it's not going to go away. You know, the gypsy travellers are here and, you know, we recognise them as, as being here and that something needs to be done for them. But it's, it's not a pleasant task to particularly find the right location. Sean McMahon has a, a supplementary on that and I'll come back to Marco. Thanks, Kavina. It was just... Um a language problem that is starting to irritate me, if, if you don't mind. Um, you've read the reports, some of you had said, and I just think throughout our reports and in our previous report, we said that the term was Gypsy Traveller. That's an ethnic grouping that we talk about Gypsy Traveller. We don't talk about gypsies. And we certainly don't talk about Traveller and we don't talk about these people. So if we could just continue, because frankly, um, there are other issues that I would, I would like to manage, but I think if you've been consistent in all reports that we're doing in this committee, um, then all we would ask is that everyone uses the terminology and if we were talking about any other ethnic grouping, we would be doing the same. So um, I would appreciate if we could do that. Thanks. 
Do you have any further no. questions? I'll bring Dennis in. Alex, do you have any further questions you'd like to ask? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, if my understanding is correct, uh, none of you have engaged with the gypsy travelling community. Um, and to that point, it would appear that a lot of what you're saying is based on assumption and perception. And what's becoming fairly evident, I think, is that, and I think with a couple of exceptions, that something is needing to be done, but it's not to be done in close proximity to where we live. Um, so if it's not going to be in close proximity to where you live, then where is it going to be? Now, you made reference um, to a report in 2008 when the North East, when three councils came together, and that report actually highlighted there should have been something like about 35 sites. And within the North East, there's one. So therefore, if you just take that basic arithmetic, you can see that there is a problem there for our gypsy travelling community as to where they can actually go. They are an ethnic uh, group of people, um, they do travel, and even those in settled communities still prefer to be called gypsy travellers, uh, regardless of the fact that they've been settled in permanent housing. I'm concerned that, um, and, and I don't particularly like the term nimbyism, but I'm concerned with the fact that it would appear that you're maybe content to pay some degree of lip service to the problem, but there, there endeth the story because you're not prepared to engage. And in fact, we, we heard this morning that you wouldn't even be prepared to engage even going in pairs to uh, engage in dialogue. Now, my understanding is in the North East there has, actually has been very good dialogue uh, with the gypsy travelling community, and a lot of positives have come from that, uh, to be honest. Uh, and we will be visiting uh, the North East um, uh, in early February. Um, but my question to you is that you're making wild, I think, assumptions based on whether it's media or perceptions. And I hear what you're saying about when people leave a site, it's in a mess. Uh, I would say the councils have a responsibility um, to provide the permanent sites or transient sites. And if they haven't done that, then the gypsy travelling community have little or no option as to where they will site themselves, whether it's an unauthorised site or not. And therefore, to prevent any unhygienic mess or whatever, perhaps there's an onus on the council then, and I think you made the point, um, maybe to provide a port -a or appropriate uh, disposal for people's rubbish. And if that's not happening, therefore you're bringing on a problem. Now, I'm not saying it is up to community councils per se, but I would hope that community councils can at least have dialogue with the council, if not the gypsy travelling community, as to try and address the problem. So I, what I'm looking for from yourselves is, is perhaps at least an acknowledgement that gypsy travelling people do require somewhere to live. And given that, um, you know, what is your... Abs it would appear that you have an objection for them living near your communities. Would that be right? I'll start with James Brownhill and then move on to Christopher yeah. Ahern. I didn't particularly like what you said there, that because we haven't had any dialogue with gypsy travellers, what I've been saying is based on assumptions and perceptions. What I've been saying is based on direct experience. And I did explain that we'd endeavoured to try and liaise with the gypsy travellers, and it had failed. It's not on perceptions. And you had no dialogue with them and hadn't had any dialogue with them. I did say that because they didn't pick up our invitation. But that doesn't mean to say that, that what I've been saying is assumptions and perceptions. It's experience. I've been through the sites, as I explained, after they've left. I've seen what they leave behind. And I've spoken to people within the community that, that have lived close to the unauthorised encampments, as I have. So I, I have heard what goes on. It's not assumptions and perceptions. 
I don't take notice of the media because I don't believe a lot of what they say. So what I've been saying is not what I've got gleaned from the media. And I have explained that a favourable gypsy traveller site would be one that was away from the settled community. I'm not talking about nimbyism. I'm saying the settled community. I'm not talking about my settled community. So I'm thinking that the best solution after dialogue would be some distance away from the settled community. The gentleman there said their permanent site is in a secluded valley, slightly away from the settled community. In, that sounds in, am I correct uh, also that it was stated that the gypsy travelling people don't want to be part of and don't want to be <laughs> near to? Um, is that not based on assumption if you've had no dialogue? I didn't say that the gypsy travellers didn't want to be near the settled community. I think I'll check the official report. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're saying what, about not having dialogue with them, but I, I haven't had dialogue with the people that live at the bottom of my street who I don't know. So why would I go and have dialogue with them? I, I've, I've had no problem with them, I've got no problem with them. Why should I go and have dialogue with them? I appreciate the fact that, that Gervin has a permanent site and it seems to be a very settled community. And uh, given that, it's perhaps maybe not. But I, I would suggest that the council uh, per se have a, a responsibility, whether they have liaison officers or site managers. Right, there's a site manager who, Fine, who does that. Which is, yes. which is absolutely um, perfect. Uh, and um, I, I would agree that I would hope that councils have the appropriate uh, liaison officers to enter into dialogue, to engage with the gypsy travelling community, and then to engage with settled communities. Now, would you say that that is perhaps a, a way forward in terms of trying to engage, to have a liaison officer to engage with settled communities and the gypsy travelling communities to try and understand uh, each other communities either fears, aspirations, or needs. I think you've got. I think you've got to manage it. Um, I, I know that South Ayrshire Council have um, maidens, which is seven miles from Girvan, had a travelling site arrived several years ago, and I know that Ayrshire, South Ayrshire Council went in and offered them medical treatment, um, offered them refuse collection. Um, before they moved on, and the site was left quite quite clean. Still to medical treatment. Yes. And yes. Well, I, I've read in some of your earlier reports they weren't getting it. So absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Just what I heard and wanted to come in and then um, Betty uh, Roddick. I off the section by saying that I had spoken to the travellers in our area, um, and they were very pleasant. And I had great conversation with them, found out what they wanted, um, what they thought about the areas and why they had to choose a particular area as they did. Um, the fact that when they left, he left his caravan behind and it took two weeks for the council to get rid of it is another matter. Um, but there are also the groups that use the other site where we are, which is on two foot, the corner of two footpaths and a football pitch. Now, that isn't an appropriate site, even for temporary accommodation, somebody putting a tent up or anything for somebody parking their cars, be it a settled community parking their cars or kids pitching tents. Certainly not a suitable area for caravans. And my having walked past them to go take the dog out for a walk, some of the time they are intimidating. I wouldn't want to talk to them with their dogs as well. But the, when, I, when I do get the opportunity, I have gone and spoken to them. And the community policeman in the area does go and speak to all the groups quite regularly when they come round. And he comes to every single community meet council meeting we have, which is monthly, which is open to everyone, and he passes on their comments. Betty, <coughs> did you want to come in? A lot of the councils look on this as a problem. And rather than... I never say I've got a problem. I always look for a solution. So there is never a problem in my life. There is a problem looking for a solution, but not a problem. And I think that's a, that is a problem with the councils. The problem gets worse. It's like a dog with a bone. They gnaw away at it rather than sidestepping and looking at a proper solution. And be it gypsy travellers or any ethnic minority or any person, they, if there is a problem, there is not a problem, there's a solution. And sorry, that's my ethos in life. You do say there's not enough sites for gypsy travelling people. Yes. yes. Thank you. 
Do you have any further questions? No, um, Dennis, I'll bring in Siobhan McMahon then. John, did you want to come back in? Right, okay. Siobhan. Thanks. Just to follow up on the last point then about the lack of provision for sites, because I think the example that you've used, Mr Hearn, about where uh, Gypsy Travellers are pitching up at the moment might not be appropriate. And I think possibly, and I haven't had the discussion with them, obviously, but they might not think that that's appropriate. They might want to be settled somewhere else um, when they go. So I think it's about getting appropriate sites. And the planning process is something, again, if you've read the reports that we're discussing and, uh, and, and looking towards. So one of the, the questions I would like to ask is about the liaison officer from the council. So how, because I, I don't sit in a community council, how, when a planning application for a permanent site, and we talked about Perth possibly having one, does the liaison officer come to your meetings to discuss that so that you can go to the community um, and make sure that everyone's aware? What kind of objections would it be made? Is it solely on, it's not, not a practical area to have the site, or is it because it is too close to certain um, houses, schools, because of previous problems um, that you outlined earlier, you know, the lack of sanitation and various other things, is are those the reasons for the opposition? And have you had any, um, has this happened in the past, have you had any application that the community council have, have looked at and, and, and taken a view towards um, in the past? Yeah, well, we've got the double dikes, which doesn't actually come under our um, particular um, community council boundary, but it's about a mile outside it. But he is the liaison officer, and he does liaise with any um, transit camp uh, within the Perth district. Um, I don't think he does the one in Kinross. I think that's too far away. But he, that, they were, he was put in a number of years ago purely for that purpose, to manage that site, and now his remit is to, to manage all the other ones. And the, a lot of the sites are put on... We had five sites in Perth. Um, one was on the South Inch, which was totally inappropriate because that's a public park. <coughs> one was in the Broxton area, which is now being built on for housing. One was on the site of the new dental hospital, which is now up, and that's being built on, so they've moved away from there. Aran Road Industrial Estate, which is where I had the dialogue with the, the travellers there, and that's getting built on, so that's now being bought and it's privately owned, and it's going to be um, a site of um, buildings, so they, they can't go there either, which leaves this one particular site, which is on the corner of two footpaths and a football, play, football field. It's not appropriate, yes, be great to have a, another site, a transit site. But as I explained about the one in Kinross, even the travellers themselves, the gypsy travellers themselves, turn around and say that it's dirty. The, there's two differences. As, as I was trying to find in here from Fiona Townsley, who is one of the gypsy travellers from the Double Dykes area, even she says that there's different types of people, as you get in any society. There's the people that keep the place clean. There's the people that make a mess. You can't control it. You're going to go into a temporary site for two weeks. They might not leave it. They might leave it a mess. They might leave it clean. As I said, I had a really great conversation. Really interacted well with the guys that parked down the end on Aran Road. And when he left, he left his caravan behind. Just before anyone else, I understand that. But again, if you turned the coin and said, if you're continue to develop on it land that has been used in the past, then where do the gypsy travellers go? I mean, so I think that's the problem that we're trying to get to. If you continue to build on land, and, and we heard earlier about the power station, I don't think anyone would want to pitch up beside a power station, given the option. Um, and so I think those are the differences and the engagement to have by that. And I think, again, it's important, and Fiona Townsley did say that, because we recognise that you know, we're all different you're all different, you know, and, and we recognise that in the communities as well. But if you're not getting clean water and you're not getting a caravan that has windows in it that aren't smashed, then why would you stay there? And you wouldn't ask anybody to do so. So I don't understand why at the moment, and I'm not saying it's your viewpoint, that it tends to be the viewpoint that that's OK, because it's not. I can't speak for other areas of the country, but certainly in Tayside, you've got the Tay Plan, which is trying to cope with the increase in housing that they have to do, which has come from the Scottish Government. They need to produce more housing. And any land that's available um, has been put aside for development. And if you, I had a look through it, I mean, it's about that thick. 
with the plans of where they've got and any piece of spare land around any of the villages, any of the towns, any of the cities has been put up for developments. Well, if they're all suitable land for development and you're building houses on it, where else are you going to put them? Where else are you going to build temporary sites? All the sites have been taken up. Which I would argue though, a temporary site is housing. So we could have that argument because you are building a house for someone, it's just a different type. Build them houses then? No, no. But if, if the areas have all, the, the no, areas no, have no, all no, been no. mapped out put, no. to put housing on by the local authorities to fit in with what they've been told to produce housing. But that's your terminology of what a house is because you've just said they're building a house, their house is their caravan if they travel. I was just bringing your point about the housing. But don't, yes, the, but build them a house as a site. That's their house. Where are you, you going to build, build a site when all the suitable land has been taken up so house. they can comply with their, their housing policy that's been put down from the Scottish Government? Absolutely. If all the land is available has been taken up, whereabouts yeah. are you going to put it? The only way you can put it is away from the villages and the towns. Because everything that's, everything, that's all the land around Perth that's available for building on has now been put aside in the Tay plan for building other, I don't know how to put it now, houses, permanent housing, be it local government or be private. Mm -hmm. There is no suitable land available to build a, a temporary site. Okay. You know, that comes back to what I said, that it's, it's, <coughs> it's very hard to find a suitable site uh, within a city because the city's taken up with, you know, housing or industry, um, but, uh, you know, it, it can be, well, as, as I've said now probably for the third time, that, you know, the, the optimum site is not right next door to the settled community. It is somewhere remote. So if you don't have anywhere remote in the city, you're not going to be able to find a site within the city. But hopefully you can find one, you know, that's maybe outside the city boundaries in a more rural country, remote area that... That, that you know would be suitable for gypsy travellers, um, and coming back, I know that was a bit flippant about putting them in houses. But again, we've heard how they've been settled in houses for 20 years in Lockhillpad. So again, as I said, sorry, can I correct you there? They settled in Lockhillpad in the site for 20 years. When the new houses were built, they put in an application, and they were successful. They haven't been in a house for 20 years. They were in the area for 20 years. So I, sta I, correct. I stand corrected and a, a very valid correction there. But it does show that, that, you know, that within the gypsy travel community, there is a diverse uh, um, range of, of needs or requirements and expectations. And it's that package that I was talking about earlier that the council should be trying to provide for the gypsy traveller community, whether it's permanent housing, uh, permanent sites that they can stay on in the caravans for whenever, or temporary halting sites. There is no one single solution. It needs to be a complete package. I really agree. I think that's in all community, but I'm interested in your view of the best solution would be rural. Where does that come from? Is that an opinion? Is that the community councils? Or, or is that engagement with gypsy travellers? Well, no, I, I, I've said I've never had any direct uh, verbal engagement with, with gypsy travellers. Um, so how, how can you then state that the best solution would be a rural one for gypsy travellers? Because, I, I, you know, I know from reading that they like the family around them and they like the seclusion. And we're hearing today how a, a remote site is a successful site. Um, so... And, and, you know, if you get the various organisations or, or groups together, including the settled community, the settled community will not want gypsy travellers, in my experience, uh, on the doorstep. I've got a supplementary from Alex Johnson and then Dennis Robertson, and I'll come back to you, Siobhan. Okay. It, it wasn't really a supplementary, and it's almost more of a comment than a question. Uh, and I noticed that uh, at least a couple of our witnesses are, have been getting a bit of a hard time. And uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to say that uh, I think 
from my own experience living in Stonehaven, which is a community that uh, has suffered from uh, illegal encampments uh, within the town on a number of occasions, that I think it's very important that while we have a, a broad range of views presented to the committee, that uh, I welcome the fact that we've had people who have been able to come forward to the committee today and express the views that are expressed to me on a, a regular basis by people who are living uh, at close quarters uh, to uh, particularly illegal encampments. And the, um, I hope that uh, uh, you expected to get a hard time when you came here, but I hope you feel that you, your contribution will have uh, made uh, some progress in ensuring that we get a, a good, broad understanding of the problems from every perspective uh, from this uh, inquiry. Dennis Robertson, did you have a supplementary? Yeah, just very quickly, very briefly. Um, yeah, the, the terminology the, the committee tends to prefer is unauthorised sites um, in, in terms of if, if people don't have an unauthorised place to, to have their site. Um, my, my supplementary is that, um, again, it's maybe from Siobhan's point of view uh, on the perception of rural and remote. Um, I would have hoped that we would be looking at ways of integrating uh, our gypsy travelling communities into our settled communities, as perhaps has happened at uh, Loch Kilphead. Um, integration, to me, would seem uh, a better way forward in terms of understanding. Uh, and people are transient and they do come and go, but uh, integration, to me, would I would hope that it would give a better understanding of people's lives and culture and perhaps it would be more acceptable to communities if they understood uh, through integration rather than being remote. Um, can I just say, I think we're very fortunate in Loch Elpid. I'm, I'm classed as an incomer. I've only been there 30 odd years. But they, in Loch Elpid there is a mental... Uh, hospital as well. So people have been used to prejudices and used to whatever you would like to call it. And I think people are more acceptable and they're more accepting of gypsy travellers, Polish, Ukrainian, you, you name it, and people from the, the mental asylum, as you would say. And I think that the, the actual populace of Loch Elbert are that bit more understanding and, and they're acceptable of people's traditions and ways of life. And I think that's where Loch Elbert has been, had, had a bonus for the rest of the communities. Sorry. And maybe just say to the witnesses that I too um, live in an area, um, which is Stonehaven, uh, which is again quite used to having unauthorised sites um, in that area. Uh, and I'm aware of the, the other sites within, uh, certainly, Aberdeenshire. Thank you. I, I'm not quite clear what you mean by integration in, in, of, of people who travel, because surely integration means that the people would become part of the community, but they'll not become part of the community if they keep moving on and somebody else takes their place. Understanding that uh, a lot of uh, gypsy travelling people actually do become um, fairly permanent. There's a lot of people will live, as yeah. we've heard in Loch Gilphead, they're fairly settled. And although some people will travel, quite often they may travel during maybe the spring and summer months and come back to uh, permanent sites. That's what I mean uh, in terms of, if I maybe just explain myself, that a lot of people do come back to uh, a permanent site. <coughs> And, and just before I bring you in, Mr Brownhill, we, we also heard from, from Gypsy Travellers that they have a fairly fixed travelling pattern. So, it, in, in my view, it would be easier to, to integrate or to reach some kind of understanding be, because they may be in an area <coughs> for three months and then move on, but they come back. So, while the Gypsy Travellers may stay in an area for a, a fairly short period of time, they are, from what we've heard, regular visitors to that area. So I would expect that over time it would be fairly easy to build up some kind of relationship with people that kept coming back to the same area. And I think that was one of the, the, the points that Dennis was, tr was trying to make. Mr Brownhill. 
Okay, maybe I was taking integration too lit literally, but uh, you know, we've heard at Lockheed Ped that the integration has occurred over a period of 20 years, and I can see that well happening, and, and uh, definitely I feel it's, it's a way forward. Those that want, gypsy travelers that want to integrate into the settled community can do so. Those that want to keep traveling and, and traveling and traveling, then it's, it's going to be harder for them to, well, you can't really travel and, and, and be integrated, so to speak. But, but um, you know, I think integration is the way forward, but it's going to take time. It's, it's not a solution for, for this year or next year, but we need a solution for this year, next year, um, that will lead towards integration over the next 20 years. So from, from the experience we've had here. So, you know, we've got a short term, mid, like any project, short term, mid term and long term integration, hopefully mid term, maybe long term, but it's not going to be short term. Uh, so we need a solution for, for the, the the challenge, if I can't call it a problem, the challenge that we have right now. Does anyone else want to come in on that point? Can I just say that? I think in the olden days, the, the, they were what you would call semi-permanent. They had their set ways and routes to go. They wintered down in a certain area with a, probably a certain farmer or or whatever, a certain estate, and they were out there and they did odd jobs to pay for their campsite, etc. Now that all that kind of things have changed, and even the work demeanour in farms, etc., in the states have, have changed, then your tra gypsy travellers' work is different. But they're still the regulars in that area. You know, my, hus my husband's uncle used to look forward to this gypsy traveller family coming every year because they were there and they, they had a whole day with them um, because they used to get his white heather from his garden and she used to take it away and sell it at cowl games but that's not the point, the point was she was regular and, and they, were, they had this regular roots and I think that is missing now because they don't have the, the, well, the, the places to go like the farms, the estates, whatever that they used to, to be in and I think that, that that is a lot. I'm not saying it's a, the solution is that the councils need to stand up and be counted and do something and so it's, it's fix the problems. Mm -hmm. If the other witnesses want to come in, Angela Chambers. I certainly don't think that this is an issue to be dealt with by community councillors who are volunteers. And certainly in our area, it's the temporary ones that are there for a fortnight and then maybe a while later, different ones there uh, for another while. Um, I have to say in their defence, though, that um, many of them come for um, odd jobs which are given to them by the local community, you know, like hedge cutting and all the rest of it, and they leave their hedge cuttings on the site, but that's beside the point. So to a certain extent, you know, the community is giving them work, but uh, that's and that's why they come. But it's a, it's, you know, that's that's um, that's the way it is. But as I say, I don't think that the le the integration uh, should be spearheaded by community councils. I think it needs to be spearheaded by local councils and probably f focusing on the permanent sites. Uh, rather than on the temporary places. Can I ask you then, what role would you see community councils having in this? Because community councils represent the views of the people within the community. And when gypsy travellers are in your community, whether it's for three months, six months, or permanently in your community, they are therefore members of your community. And, and in what way do you then represent their views? Right. Where I live, they are only there are only temporary um, unauthorised sites, um, but th uh, there is one site in East Lothian, um, and I don't know whether there's any integration with that particular community council or not. Um, but I think that the community council's role is to liaise and report the views of the community to the council. Not representing the views of gypsy travellers. 
Well, how can we when they're only there for a fortnight? They're still part of your community. Well, I would be reluctant to go along to some of these places and um, speak with them. Okay. Betty Roddick. I think that, uh, that is prejudice, right, wrong, whatever. I feel the community councils should be encouraging the members of their community, be the gypsy travellers, settled people, whatever, to converse, liaise, get on together. It's not a case of them and us. It's a case of we are all community together, regardless of whether you're there part-time or full-time. I'd just like to say that, I mean, I've, as I said before, I've never had really any dealings with the Gypsy Travellers on our permanent site, but I like to think that if anyone, anyone from that community came forward to the Community Council for help in something, that I would deal with them exactly the same as I would with anybody else. Do any of the other witnesses want to come in on that point? I just have to um, with the lady there, that if somebody's there for a fortnight or three or four weeks, how can you express their views? They're there, they've gone. If they want to, if they, we have a regular meeting, it's advertised, it's put on notice boards, if they want to come along to the meeting, they're quite entitled to do it. In fact, where we hold our meetings, about 50 yards from where they have their unauthorised encampment. They can come along, but they've never appeared. We have given invitations to the permanent site, which is outside of our, our remit as a community council, but we've never had anybody turn up. Do any of the other committee members have any further questions <coughs> for our witnesses this morning? Um, can I ask if any of the witnesses have any um, points they would like to make that they feel haven't been raised in the questions that, that, that we have asked? Yes, Mr. Brainhill. One probably for Siobhan, uh, um, although I'm not sure your remit. Uh, with the unauthorised campsites in Aberdeen City, um, it's always assumed that the incumbents are gypsy travellers, and I've used that term throughout today correctly. But the gypsy travellers are an ethnic group, and it doesn't include. Um, new Age travellers and occupational travellers, I think. There appears to be no check on the unauthorised campsites of whether they actually are genuine gypsy travellers or whether they're New Age travellers or occupational travellers. And therefore, all the problem we've discussed today uh, may, might not be as large as, as we expect. What I, I'm not saying that every end encampment is 100% new age and occupational. I don't know what the percentage is. It won't be 100, and, and probably it, it's very small, but it's not something that, that's ever checked. And yet we've spent you know, time discussing today a problem that we don't really know the magnitude of it because we don't know how many of them are true ethnic gypsy travellers and how many of them a new age occupational travellers. So how do we get round that one? Because I don't have a clue. Yeah, I mean, it's not really. I mean, it's for everyone, so it's not specifically something that for me to address. But, I mean, it's something that we've heard in evidence, and, and I suppose you're turning the coin the other way. In the evidence we've heard is that in order to prove yourself a GP or whatever, you, you're asked if you're a gypsy traveller. I mean, why should you be asked? I think that's the key to this, you know, some of us are in ethnic groups, be it Italian or Irish or anything else, no one asks us, unless it's a census form. So, I understand what you're saying, an ethnic group is protected, and that was the question that I asked about those sites, and there may be some groups of people who, you talked about children in tents earlier, Mr Ahern, you know, there has to be checks and balances on that, I don't know how you could distinguish between the two, if I'm perfectly honest, because I think that's coming... Um, again with the stereotype and the prejudice and the chip in the shoulder mentality um, if you start down that route but it's something certainly that, that we could have a look at um, and explore in a bit more detail um, is, is the only way obviously with the convener's permission but I think you know, <coughs> we've turned the coin on something that we've been looking the other way and I'm more than happy to pursue it but I, I don't have the answer for you today, absolutely not. Uh, for, for, uh, 
for us to assess the magnitude of, of the challenge of gypsy travellers, we, we need figures. Um, well, and that's something that you said you've read the report, so I'm sure you're aware. We don't actually know the numbers because gypsy travellers themselves aren't reporting that they're gypsy travellers for fear of people then expressing themselves against them, that they're a gypsy traveller and taking um, action against them. So, so they're fearful of presenting themselves as gypsy travellers. So even the government's own figures, we believe, are, are only 10% of what's happening across Scotland. It's a wider um, ethnic group in, that's ever been reported. So I accept what you're saying is that others aren't included in that ethnic group and, and that they may be in um, those, those areas, the, the temporary um, areas. However, given that we think it's a, it's a bigger um, ethnic group in, than has ever been reported, there's, there's certainly, and I think that goes back to the mapping exercise and the scoping exercise, a lot more work has to be done in this area. How we do it, I don't have the answer for you today, but I'm sure the committee will be looking at that. As a, as a question that, that as a committee we have posed, because the government have a figure for the number of gypsy travellers across Scotland, <clears throat> and the gypsy travellers and MECOP themselves tell us there are far more gypsy travellers but it's very difficult to get an accurate figure of the number of gypsy travellers. And one of the reasons that we felt a mapping exercise would be beneficial, it would help us to better assess the exact figure of gypsy travellers. Okay, can advise me why the, the figures that were published by the Scottish Government up to, was it 2008, 2009, the, the twice yearly count of gypsy travellers, why that one came to an end? And is there anything to replace it? And the other question is in the, the recent census, I think you were allowed to put your ethnic group down as gypsy travellers, which is a completely different figure sort of thing. So, so why did those, those two yearly uh, uh, counts come to an end and are they being replaced? And is the 2011 census going to provide us with any information? It's included in, in the census, a gypsy traveller. Um, <coughs> I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, I can't tell you why the, the, the twice yearly count came to an end, but I will find that out. Um, but, but it is part of the census now. Yeah. Do any of the other um, witnesses have any comments that they would like to make that they feel haven't been covered in our um, questions today? Could I just repeat that I feel um, gypsy travellers, ethnic minorities, we are all human beings. And we should all respect each other. And if you feel intimidated, please don't just calm down and say hello, how are you? And that will probably find it. You'll be able to get something. You've been saying you can't go in because they're intimidating. If you are not intimidated, they can't intimidate you. So please try and say hello, how are you? Don't say I'm here to see what mess you've made. I'm here to see how you are. I'm sorry, it's just one of my bugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. Can I thank our witnesses this morning for coming along and giving us your evidence? It's certainly been a, a very useful session, I think, and we've got a lot from it, and it will help us in our further deliberations of Gypsy Travellers and where they live. And that concludes our formal meeting today, and our next meeting will take place on Thursday the 17th of January and will include oral evidence from voluntary organisations and public service providers on where Gypsy Travellers live. So thank you very much. <laughs>